So buy an application. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, much better if I uh, speak to you in English now because I can be much more <laughs> eloquent and easier, faster speaker. So please excuse me if I uh, give my talk in English. I'm going to tell you a, a little bit about my story, my lifelong journey, and how I became so interested in India and especially in Kongu Nadu. So it started in Lebanon when I was 13 years old. But before we go to that, I'll just show you a few pictures of my most recent trip to India. It was a wonderful a time in uh, Kongu Nadu in 2020. And uh, this was one of the uh, events. So we went to a nice uh, wedding uh, near Karur. And uh, this is with my husband, who's uh, just celebrated his 90th birthday. And that's one reason it's uh, not uh, been possible for me to come to Georgia this year, because uh, it's not easy for us to travel, especially uh, with his age. But this is what we looked like in Tamil Nadu uh, as uh, Kongu Karala. And uh, we had a wonderful pati pongal in Kongu Nadu. And I was really surprised when uh, my husband and I were given the honor of being the Rani and the Raja of the Pati. And this was in 2020. And there we are seated together. I'm not accustomed to that headgear, but uh, it was a nice honor. And uh, there was a lovely shrine to the Kanimar, as you see them down at the bottom of the screen here, the Yerlu Kanimar. And uh, they were a prominent part of the Patipongal ceremony. And this is the Tepakulam, where the cows were asked to cross in celebration of the event and the uh, crossing to the sky and the sea that is above. So the pictures of the lovely Patipongal, I think that will uh, bring back memories for you all of how really uh, colorful and uh, lively and exciting the Pati Pongal is in uh, Kongu Nadu. The Pongal, of course, and watching the pot boil over and laying out the offerings to the gods there on the leaves. And there was even a nice uh, reenactment of the uh, churning of the ocean. And uh, we had the women pulling on one side and men pulling on the other. And uh, we had a lot of Fun. It was a game associated with the Patipongo and the lovely uh, blossoms related to it too. Okay, now you all will want to know how did I get interested in Kongu Nadu to begin with? Well, it started in Beirut, Lebanon. I actually says here 54, but I believe it was 53. And my father was teaching at the university in Beirut and he had a sabbatical leave for a year, and as some of you probably know, that's a nice um, kind of special uh, benefit that the university professors have. They're given leave now and then to do research. So he wanted to do research on educational institutions in various countries in the Middle East and South Asia. So he found this secondhand little bus, which was um, used to transport employees from the airport in Beirut. And we bought it secondhand and he uh, outfitted it. This was before uh, we had the kind of, uh, uh, you know, vans that are used today for travel, the RVs. But he made the back into beds and we had a little kerosene stove and we lived in this bus for a year. And this is the, just before we set out my mother, you can see her through the window and my father over here on the right. Another picture of myself and my father just before we left. And the, of course, from Beirut, the uh, path was to set out across the desert in Syria. And so this is what it looked like uh, on the desert. And I actually learned to drive because uh, there was no danger, no traffic, no uh, stoplights uh, in the middle of the Syrian desert. So it was a good place to learn how to use the engine and the controls. But there were also difficulties in the desert. It wasn't always dry and smooth. We ran into water and mud and got stuck uh, several times. 
but we managed always to get ourselves out. And, and this is one little story that's uh, uh, in a way kind of just a side story, but it shows you what life was like living in this bus. We were driving up to Turkey because we wanted to uh, see the great um, mosque and other things in Istanbul before heading east. And so we came to the Sea of Marmara, which is a large body of water, just as you cross from Syria into Turkey. And they were just building the road. It was a new road. And so it was very rocky and, and rough. We decided to try it. And very soon after getting on this road, we thought, well, we better stop for the night and rest. So we just parked and we had little curtains on the windows of the van. So we pulled the curtains and went to sleep. And very early in the morning, it was just beginning to get light. We heard the sound of a flute. So my mother and I pulled the curtain back and there were these men beside the bus and they were playing the flute and they were dancing and trying to wake us up. And we, of course, we couldn't speak Turkish, but we thought they must be welcoming us. So we opened the door and we said hello and thank you for the welcome. And my mother took the kerosene stove and she made hot water and made some tea and she offered the men tea. They accepted the tea and it was a nice little kind of small party early in the morning. And then all of a sudden the men started to talk very rapidly amongst themselves and they jumped up and they ran over to the edge of the road which dropped off to the sea very, very quickly and very sharply. Well, I was curious and so I followed and I looked over the edge of this little cliff just in time to see one of the men, he, he took off all his clothes and he jumped into the water. I thought, what is he doing? He swam around and he dove under the water and all the men were shooting. And then he came back up and he was holding this huge fish in his hand. And he came back on shore, gave the fish to his friends, put his clothes back on and then climbed up the cliff and handed this live fish to us. And it was their gift to say thank you for the tea that we had served them. So that was a, a nice story. And, and we had many, uh, many adventures like that on our trip. We met many, many people. So this is uh, when we got to Iran, to Persepolis, which is one of the wonderful old uh, ruins of the ancient uh, Persian civilization. And uh, there's probably not allowed to sit on these wonderful uh, monuments then, uh, now, but then it was, uh, nobody was uh, concerned. And so my father said, why don't you jump up there and I'll take your picture. And I really like this picture and it kind of makes me think of Nandi and uh, the great Nandi in Mysore, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. And also it's become quite a, significant to me because some of my recent research has uh, been uh, showing me that there are some very important connections between Kongu Nadu and ancient Mesopotamia. So uh, we'll leave it at that. And when, when we got to Afghanistan, the going was quite rough and it was early spring. And as you know, the Hindu Kush mountains that are on the north side of Afghanistan, all the spring rivers flooded with melting snow. And there's seven major rivers that come down off the Hindu Kush through Afghanistan. And people told us, well, the road goes south, but you can't get across those rivers right now because everything is flooded. You can cross with a camel, but you can't take your car. Well, that was no good for us because we needed our car. That was our house, our home. So they said, well, the only way, other way to get across Afghanistan is to go north of the mountains. And there's no real road, there's just a kind of a mud track. And you'll have to go with a caravan of other trucks and nobody goes by themselves. So they said, stay in a caravanserai, which is where the ancient traders stayed with their caravans. And now in the modern times, the truckers stay with their trucks. So we stayed in the caravanserai and this is a picture of our truck in the caravanserai. And then the next day we set out and the trucks looked like this. <laughs> they were the buses of Afghanistan and, and they were so popular and there were so, they were in such demand that they became double layer 
the trucks with at least 100 men per truck. And actually, that was very useful because several times we got stuck. We still had to cross small rivers on the northern side of the Hindu Kush as well. And when we got stuck, these 100, and they were actually about seven trucks with us. So there were hundreds of men. They just got down off their truck. They were all friends and they all were kind of taking care of us. And they just physically lifted our car up out of the mud, off the stones, carried it across the river and put it on the other side. So they, we were very grateful to them for their help. Well, meeting with okay. Hello? Uh, you can ask me a question if you want. So this is uh, now we've come down from Afghanistan and we're in New Delhi. And this was my first uh, introduction, of course, to India in Delhi. And uh, I like the salwar kameez the women were wearing. And my mother said, OK, well, we'll get you a salwar kameez outfit. So that's my first Indian dress there. When I was still uh, 13, I think just turning 14 in the spring of um, 1954. And then we went south, we traveled right through India. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, so you will recognize this. This is my store, and uh, that's me standing there uh, in side the uh, sort of front uh, paws, front legs of Nandi, one of my favorite animals. And you see now why I'm reminded of the uh, double-headed uh, uh, image that I saw in Persepolis. But we traveled on down to Tamil Nadu. And at that time, for some reason I have never understood, we were not, we needed to sell our van in order to get back home. But um, for some reason, there was a rule you could not sell your car in India at that time. So my, we went all the way to Danishkoti, and my father took a barge of some kind across to Sri Lanka, where he sold our van. And we flew to Thailand, to Bangkok, from Chennai, and we met him in Chennai. So that was my first exposure to India, and of all the places that we visited, um, Tamil Nadu was the last place that we went, and I think we must have driven through Kongu Nadu, and I still have to look through the old uh, photographs that uh, my mother and father left me to see if I can find some pictures uh, of that visit in 1953, but I don't have them at the moment. But I, I'm sure that we went through Kongu Nadu on our way south to Danishkoti. So then, um, years later, I was so fascinated with India, and I remembered uh, Tamil Nadu especially because it was so colorful. The women wore these colorful saris, and everybody was so friendly. And uh, I thought, gee, I would really like to go back and learn more about Tamil Nadu. So as my education progressed and I went to Oxford, as you know, Oxford had the... Um, empires in both India and Africa. And so there's a lot of uh, good library resources about those two parts of the world and a lot of uh, people teaching at the university who are familiar with those cultural areas. So they, as an anthropologist, which was my choice of subject, uh, I had to choose between India and Africa. And well, <laughs> you hardly need to ask me why I chose India. And then, my teachers were saying, well, you have to go and spend two years doing research to get your doctorate. And you've chosen India. You have to learn one of the languages. What language uh, would you like? And I thought about it a little while and I decided really I would like to learn Tamil. And why? Because Tamil was not an Indo-European language. It was not a North Indian language related to Greek and Latin and German and all the other European languages. It's, it, I knew that it was a Dravidian language and that it was a separate family. And I thought this will be more interesting. I'll learn more and I'll be able to maybe understand the world a little differently if I learn a non-Indo-European language. So I chose Tamil 
for that reason. And of course, there are four major uh, Dravidian languages, but Tamil is uh, the best known, has the early literature, and uh, it seemed to be the obvious one to choose. So then the question became, where in Tamil Nadu are you going to go? And I didn't have a good idea, but I knew of a famous professor in France that was teaching in Paris. His name was Louis Dumont, and I had read his works, and he had studied uh, in Madurai, or near Madurai. And I thought, well, why don't I just go to Paris and meet this famous professor and ask for his advice? So I did that. And he said, while I was in Madurai, some people from Kongu Nadu came and visited me. And they were very interesting. And they told me interesting things about Kongu Nadu. But nobody's ever done research on Kongu Nadu that I know of, certainly no anthropologist. So why don't you, as your PhD topic, go to Kongu Nadu and study that? So I said, OK, well, that's good advice. So then I began asking about Kongu Nadu, and I learned that Coimbatore was the sort of biggest city in Kongu Nadu. And so I took a train from Mumbai to Coimbatore. And at first I stayed in the YWCA in Coimbatore. And the girls there were very friendly and, you know, I had a nice welcome in Coimbatore. But the problem was all those nice girls at the YWCA wanted to learn English. And they kept, you know, begging me, teach me English, talk English, please talk with me in English. Well, that was nice for them, but my desire was to learn Tamil. And I knew that I couldn't really learn Tamil in that environment. So I said, I have to go to a village and I have to choose a village where people are not speaking English. And I had a friend, a woman there, who knew a doctor in Kongim. I was, I was asking where in Kongu Nadu, where's a traditional area that would be a good place to go? I wanted a place that had a lot of history. And most people said, well, Kongim is the place we know where there's a lot of history. So I asked my girlfriend, can we go and meet your doctor friend in Kongim? And so we went there one day on a trip and she introduced me to her friend and the doctor was very friendly. And he said, well, why don't you come with me? I have to go tomorrow and uh, some villages near here where I have patients, I need to go and see them. So just come with me and you can see several villages and you can choose where you would like to stay. Well, after that, on his recommendation, I chose Olapalium. And that is where I spent nearly two years between 1964 and 1966. So that's how I came to stay in the village of Olapalium. And I'm very grateful to the doctor who recommended it. It turned out to be a good choice. Uh, not too remote a village. It was on the main road. And so I was able to learn a lot about the broader area. I wasn't too isolated. And there was a nice block development officer there in the village. And he had a very nice idea. I, I said, well, I need some help. I need a woman to live with and you know, somebody who will cook for me. I have no idea how to cook on traditional stove and traditional food. And he said, I know the perfect woman. Her name is Papa. And uh, so he introduced me to Papa and, and I liked her. She didn't know a word of English, um, but I felt that you know she was a woman that I would be happy with. So I said, OK, and then they found me a little house <laughs> and you won't believe how much I paid in rent for that house. Six rupees a month was my rent. <laughs> Can't even buy a cup of coffee for that nowadays. Anyway, that's uh, that's where I stayed. And uh, I'll show you some pictures in a moment of that. But first, uh, in case you don't know where Olapolium is, it's Kongium, and that's where Olapolium is very near to Kongium. And I've circled here essentially uh, what I consider to be Kongu Nadu. Uh, and, you know, people may debate a little bit where the edges of it are. I think they're a little bit vague, but uh, basically geographically, it's pretty well defined. There are quite high mountains all along the Western edge and there are lesser mountains, but still significant mountains also 
um, dotted and spotted around the rest of the area. So it's a it's an upland alluvial plain with the waters coming down from south south from the mountains and flowing across Kongunaru. It's a, it's a natural geographic area, upland area. And I put these green lines in. These are not rivers. These are trade routes, traditional trade routes. And Kongu was very important because there were many, many traders coming from the west coast where the boats would land. I know a lot of people think the east coast boats and so on and archaeology on the east coast is important. But I believe the west coast was probably even more important because there was a huge amount of trade with Greece and Rome and uh, earlier than that, uh, Sumer and uh, places in Mesopotamia and also, of course, uh, the famous uh, area of the uh, civilization in um, in this valley area of Pakistan. And there's not been a lot of work on the boats from there because boats, <laughs> when they die or they sink, uh, they're very hard to recover, even with underground, underwater archaeology, especially because it's a very deep trench along here. And so the boats slide down to a very deep level and then the currents wash them and so it's very hard to find them. But I'm convinced that there was a lot of trade, a lot of trade on the West Coast. And there's a famous gap, one famous gap here, you'll all know it, the Palgat Gap. And it's such a obvious gap, you can see it from the ocean itself quite clearly. And so the traders would stop and say, oh, there's a nice gap, there's where we can go through the mountains and get into the places where we want to trade in the other parts of the south. So the fact that Kongunaru is connected with the Palgat Gap is quite significant. And I've actually been there and you can physically see the old trade route uh, and some of the inscriptions of the old trade route. It's one of the few places in India where you can actually see the remains of an old trade route. Most of them have you know, been buried under cities and, and roads and so on, but the Palgat Gap, you can still see it. Okay, so the other reason I wanted to show you this map, same idea, here's Kongunaru, it's, it's really pretty much in the middle of the peninsula and it's surrounded by mountains and it has these trade routes. The importance of this map, and I know some of you were talking about it earlier this evening, the three famous kingdoms, of course, in the south, the Chara, the Pandya, and the Chola, but they were really coastal kingdoms. Yes, the Cheras did uh, reign in Karur for some time, and Karur is a very important ancient city in Kongunaru, I quite agree. But basically taking a big picture, Kongunaru never had a famous line of kings that was you know, specific to it. Uh, instead, the Chera, Chanda, Pandyas and Cholas fought over Kongunaru. They all wanted it um, because it was a great resource area. But none of them were able to hold on to it for very long, partly because the people in Kongunaru were quite fierce. And that's clear from the Sangam poetry. There are a lot of references to Kongu uh, uh, tribal chiefs who were quite fierce and tough. So I'm showing you this because I think a lot of the spirit of Kongunaru and the spirit of the Ananmarkade is an expression of the feeling of people in this area that we are important too. We have a great cultural tradition of our own and we've had heroes of our own. And those two heroes are the heroes of the Ananmar story. And that's one of the reasons the story has been, has lasted and been so popular because it expresses the enthusiasm that the people of Kongunaru, as you have, I know, <laughs> enthusiasm for your culture and your traditions. And people have wanted to say, listen to us, listen to our great traditions. Here's a, a, a map just to show you briefly. This is basically the trade route. Here was the uh, gap. Here's the, the kind of uh, trade routes that were important. They were coming all the way from Egypt but most importantly from Babylon, coming from the Mediterranean, uh, Greece and Rome, and coming down from the Indus River as well. And they, everybody came down the West Coast, and of course the trade winds will practically carry you down. You don't have to do much 
to float down when the winds are blowing to the south. And you don't have to do much another season of the year when they're blowing the opposite direction to go back. So it was an obvious route. And there were lots of resources here uh, in Kerala that were of interest to people in the Mediterranean and in ancient Babylon, especially the man mangrove uh, forests, the great trees that were used for building, and also uh, some of the minerals and uh, some of the spices and other things that were very popular. So now a little bit about my life in Olapalium. This is the main street where uh, the bicycles were rented and I rented a bicycle now and then to get myself around and uh, friendly merchants there who were helpful. And uh, the ox carts, of course, were very popular, there were very few cars uh, in that time. And the library and some of the girls that were my friends. And this is now in my house. I had one little table and one chair. That was the extent of my furniture. And uh, this woman here in brown, this is Papa. She's the woman I lived with who was my cook and companion. Wonderful woman, very, very smart, but didn't know a word of English. And uh, these are other uh, people. That was kind of the entertainment for the village. People uh, always thought, well, you know, let's do something. Let's go see that white lady. You know, she's kind of different. She's funny. We can laugh at her. And uh, I was struggling to learn Tamil. And so I was I laughed at a lot, but I, I just had to accept the fact that, you know, that was in a sense a positive thing that people uh, found me entertaining. Uh, I tried to adjust. My house was kind of old and it, it had a, especially this old entrance way. This, this was actually uh, ex not in my house, but the kind of uh, corridor that I had to go through to get to my house. And there was a gentleman living here in this room who was kind of a, a guardian and a, a, a gatekeeper, if you like, and that was very useful. So there I am carrying water. Of course, we didn't have any running water. This is the inside of my house. It was a very simple little square house. And unfortunately, while I was there, Papa uh, became a widow. And so she, her sari color changed uh, to white. And from then on, I always knew we were wearing a white sari. And this, I don't remember, but maybe it was Pongal Day or something. She had done this lovely design in front of the doorway for me. This is on the pinna where I always ate my food and she's laying out my dinner there for me. And I did have one other piece of furniture and that was this lovely cot, strung cot. And uh, we, it had many purposes. We had guests sit on it and then I would sit on it. And sometimes even other guests would, uh, I would share my cot, give it to them and sleep on a, just a straw mat on the floor. These, these were my possessions. And I had one trunk and I kept my books and my camera and I had a tape recorder that I kept in my little metal trunk. And I had one tin can which is an old biscuit can. You might wonder why I'm telling you about my biscuit can, but it was actually, it turned out to be very useful because I kept all my film and my tapes for my tape recorder. We of course didn't have anything digital in those days. We had physical tapes. And there was an issue with the, especially during the rainy season, things being damp and uh, dampness can ruin film and, and uh, audio tapes. So I kept them tightly sealed in a tin can, but every once in a while I needed to dry the tin can out to make sure that uh, moisture didn't collect. So we actually physically put it on our little stove and uh, my cook always laughed at me that I would you know, cook my tin can, but <laughs> that was the way that I dried it out and kept things safe. This is me, I sometimes wore the Yetugejum Sile and this is me bringing water to the house. Uh, in one, one of those days. This is a bunch of uh, Gounder men who were all friendly and helpful and everybody um, really you know, took extra effort to try to teach me and, and help me learn about local customs. This, this man here was the school teacher and he was the only man in the village that knew some English, but I insisted that he could only come and visit if he would speak to me in Tamil and he agreed to that. So. Uh, that way I was, uh, 
had constant exposure to Tamil. And by the end of two years, I became, you know, quite fluent and able to understand almost everything that was said and spoken about. But unfortunately, it's it's been almost 60 years now since I lived in a village and, and was fluent in Tamil. And here I don't have much of an opportunity to speak Tamil. And so unfortunately, I've forgotten a great deal of it. And that's why I'm speaking to you in English today. These are some of the nice animals. I always loved goats and there were lots of goats in the village to enjoy. And I tried various things that, you know, I wanted to learn as much as I could in terms of skills. So I tried spinning. I tried planting rice. Carrying water, of course, you've seen that in other pictures. Uh, I tried making pottery with the potter's wheel and that's the potter's wife. It was, an, of course, an electrified wheel and she would spin it while I or her husband was uh, making a pot. I tried pounding and uh, husking uh, rice. Another spinning picture, excuse me. And this one you've seen at the beginning, this was my wedding sari. Whenever some big event uh, was on, I would put this sari on and go to the special event. And I also was, I've always been interested in the lotus flower and um, so I had a, and the blue lotus flower, of course, is very special. And so I had a sari that I kind of thought of as my blue lotus sari. And one day I had a chance to sit on a stone in a pond and pretend to be a blue lotus. So that's my blue lotus picture. And uh, after about a year, my mother got very curious and she wanted to come and visit me. So I gave her my blue lotus sari. And uh, she spent about uh, 10 days or so with me in the village. And that was so uh, really fun to have her visit. And I'll tell you a little story about Papama. Of course, my mother couldn't remember any words in Tamil. It just seemed so foreign to her. Uh, but one day she turned to Papa and she said, Papa, coffee, please. This big smile came over Papa's face. And she said to me in Tamil, <laughs> she was so happy because she thought my mother had learned the word coffee. Of course, Papama didn't realize that coffee was an English word. And uh, we had lovely uh, potters in the village who made these wonderful pottery horses to gift to the gods. And so my mother and I decided to sponsor uh, a horse, we had the potter make the horse and we gave it to uh, Mahalayaman, uh, who was the goddess in the village where I was staying. This is a picture of me with Papa, uh, both of us wearing white saris that day. And this is me uh, with one of the families in the village. It's just pictures of me there, that's with a Brahmin woman. And uh, I asked her to teach me how to put the sari on the Brahmin style. And so she taught me that. These are people visiting my house. They used to come uh, again, just to, just to look at me often, just to stare at me. Sometimes they wanted to touch me, touch my hair, uh, touch my skin, just because it looked different. But after about five or six months, they, they began to get used to me and they <laughs> didn't stare at me so much, which was a nice change. This is a big festival uh, for the Shiva temple in Ganapuram, which is right near Lalayam. And uh, so I'm there uh, participating in the pulling of the great chariot. And now, and you, you know by the change in the color, uh, this is the new topic now, I want to tell you about the Ananmarkade. And I know that um, you are interested and you want to know how I decided to study the Ananmarka. Well, one night, uh, it was I think a full moon night and I'd only been in the village about two months and I heard an Urukai drum. And I turned to Papa and I said, oh, and uh, she said, uh, this must be a singer. Let's go out to the uh, temple in the middle of the village and see who's singing. And so we went and we discovered two singers. It was night and I don't have any pictures of this event. So this is part of the animation of the story. 
show you uh, essentially what it looked like. There were two singers, the lead singer and his Budokai assistant, and a whole range of people of all ages were sitting around listening to their stories. And I thought, this is interesting. And maybe this is an opportunity to learn something more about the culture. And I, we didn't have video cameras back then, but I had a tape recorder. And so I said to the bards, could I tape record your story? I'd like to study it. And they were very happy. And they said, yes, of course, we give you permission. I had to tell them what a tape recorder was and show them how it could capture the voice and the sounds. They, they were quite surprised and, and pleased. And they said, yes, of course. And, and then they turned to me and they said, what story would you like us to tell? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. You tell me what story. And so the bards turned to the audience and they said, what story do you want to hear? And the audience said, Anamarkade, Anamarkade, Adamvenu. So, okay. Uh, I said, fine, let's have the, I didn't know what it was, but something about some brothers. And I thought, oh, you know, maybe 15, 20 minute, half an hour story. I got out my tape recorder and started recording. Well, they sang and they sang, went on for two hours. And then they said, okay, we're going to stop for tonight. And we'll come back tomorrow night. And I said, really? And he said, yes, we haven't finished the story yet. So they came back the next night and the next night. And I began to get worried it was running out, running out of batteries because this was the village was not electrified at the time. They were just beginning the project of electrifying villages. And they, were, they had run some main wires down the, the main road, but there weren't any wires going into the village at that point. But the wonderful gift, uh, the next morning, a man came to my house and he said, I'm the line man. I've been working on those electrical lines. I can give you a secret connection <laughs> to the main line. And I said, wow, wouldn't that be wonderful? And so he pulled out this little thin wire. It was very dangerous, I guess. And I'm sure it wasn't legal, but he made somehow secretly a connection to that main line and brought it to the house and uh, somehow had a transformer or whatever to bring it, step it down to the power that I could use for my tape recorder. And that was such a gift because I had no idea at the time. The story took 38 hours. It was sung for 18 nights. And I could never, never have recorded it if I hadn't had some help like this. So anyway, after the 18 nights, finally, uh, they told me the story was over. This is what it looked like. We didn't have electric light, but we had these pandam, the uh, uh, kind of torches that um, people would hold to light the singers. And that was wonderful because it's, it's a beautiful lighting. It's very soft. It's very uh, kind of yellowish orange light. And it flickers a bit, which gives it kind of some mystery. And what I especially noticed was there were shadows because the men were sitting against the white temple wall and the pandams were always in front of the men. And so they cast the shadow onto the wall. And I used to watch the shadows. I couldn't understand a lot of the story as it was being told, but I could get the feeling from the shadows and especially from the songs, which I've always loved about the Andenmarkade. And I could tell, you know, if there was a lullaby, you could feel the cradle rocking, or if the horses were running, you could hear the hooves of the horses. And, and you could kind of see that uh, style and energy expressed in the shadows uh, that the singers' bodies threw against the wall. And these are the singers, the wonderful singers who are responsible for all of what I have studied and done with the Anand Markadai since then. And this is the lead singer, uh, E.C. Ramasamy, who, whom I'm greatly indebted for his wonderful in-depth knowledge. He was a great storyteller. And his assistant, who was actually his nephew, whose name was Polanasamy. And uh, it was always hard to take pictures of them singing because their skins were dark, especially Ramasamy had quite dark skin. And so against a white wall, he always looked dark. So I had them in the daytime once uh, sit outside in the sun against the tree so that they could, uh, their faces would be more, better seen. 
And then the son of my cook, the son of Papa, uh, whose name was Sundaram, uh, he was a very bright uh, young man and he uh, became my research assistant and he was fascinated by my tape recorder and I taught him how to do the recording. So he actually always held the microphone and turned the tape recorder on and off and took great care with all the tapes. And this is the tape recorder. And on the 38th, the 18th night, when the story was finally finished, <laughs> they wanted to do a puja to the tape recorder, to thank the tape recorder. And that was a very nice event. And here we are um, honoring the tape recorder for having captured the whole story. And later, uh, I also, because the story as it was sung was quite difficult to transcribe and to uh, put down on paper. So I had the singer come and dictate the story. And uh, Sundaram actually wrote it down, hand, hand wrote it line by line, the whole story, well, hundreds, I think over a thousand pages of handwritten uh, story. Uh, and so I actually have two very good versions. They're very similar, but different because the the performed version is much more expressive and, and uh, much richer in detail. Uh, so I have two versions of the story as told to me in uh, 1965, early 1965. And that was eventually published from Chennai in 1992 uh, by the Institute of Asian Studies. And I'm very grateful to them for doing that. They actually kind of found it, uh, I was circulating it and, and a translation uh, amongst friends and somebody got a hold of it and said, oh, we've got to publish this. So there is a 1992 version, but it's extremely hard to find now. It's very rare and it's not been reprinted. The, the artwork here is, is one of my photographs of the two brothers, the Ananmar, uh, as painted on a temple wall that I found back then. So now, uh, what is it, about 30 years, 35 years later, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, something like that, 30 years later, um, I feel that it's really important to republish it because the text is very interesting and, and very important for people to be able to access. So I'm in the process of publishing it now. This is what the cover is going to look like. It's coming out in paperback and I'm trying to keep the price down. It's not a project to make money. It's a project to share the story even more widely. And so I hope many of you will want to have a copy when it comes out a few months from now. I'm, I'm struggling still with the publisher. The publisher doesn't like all these little dots and lines under the letters to represent the Tamil font, but I insisted that we do that so that uh, readers would be clear. Uh, what the words were as written in Tamil. So that's coming out shortly. And I just, we don't have time, of course, for a 38 hour story, but just to give you a few ideas um, of a few things that I really like about the story. One is the birth of the mother of the two heroes, whose name is Tamarai. And not surprisingly, Tamarai is born in a Tamarai in a lotus flower. And it's uh, Shiva and Parvati had some love play up in the heavens and a little bit of semen dropped down into the lotus and the lotus opened up and there was this beautiful child called Tamarai. And then the father of the heroes, uh, whose name was Kundrudia, which essentially I think means uh, the man of the rocks or the hillock. Um, it's a long story we don't have time for, but uh, Shiva uh, created him under a pile of rocks and his father uh, found him there and uh, raised him. But unfortunately, uh, about, oh, I believe about six or eight years after his birth, his parents died and he became an orphan. And so he struggled a lot uh, early in life uh, had to sleep, you know, with the cows and the horses and uh, had to collect wood from the forest in order to uh, make enough money to survive. But he, before that, before his parents died, uh, they were very good to him. And, and they, this is the ceremony where they name him. 
but after that, when the his parents, who were quite old at the time, they die of a natural death, but the, their son is still very young. And the uh, mean cousins come and they uh, knock down the palace and they are not very good to the boy. They, they say they'll take him in, but they really exploit him and, and make him work hard. And they just give him a loincloth to wear and they, they don't treat him with much respect. And he, here he is as a shepherd for a lot of his early life. And he finally gets uh, an invitation to work for a, a very good uh, family with some status. And uh, there uh, he begins to be a very kind of uh, man, Charlie, we would say in English, uh, you know, helper did many things. Uh, he noticed that they had a, a, a much younger sister and uh, they fall in love and uh, eventually uh, he has many dreams of her because he's obviously he's just a, a laborer in this family and the two elder brothers of this lovely girl don't think he's worthy of marrying their younger sister but Vishnu intervenes and, and helps and uh, the two of them do manage uh, with Vishnu's help, uh, managed a love marriage. And there they are. They have to marry in the forest at an old temple because um, they, they are not accepted. As, it's not a marriage that's really uh, much accepted by her parents. And he, of course, doesn't have any parents. He's an orphan. So after they marry, uh, they're outcasted. They're told never to come back to her village. And they on foot go searching for his uh, ancient family lands. They finally find them. He remembers how the temples looked. And when he sees the temples in the distance, he knows that that's his old farmland. And they build themselves a simple hut and live in it. And there's much, much more to the story. But um, she realizes after some time that she's unable to have a child for reasons I haven't time to go into, but anyway, uh, it's upsetting and her husband is upset and so on. And so finally they decide to go on a very uh, long pilgrimage to Kailasa to see if they can ask Shiva to uh, give her the great gift of a pregnancy. And on the way, uh, various animals from the kingdom, because the whole, she's barren and unable to have uh, child and so all the animals and other people in the kingdom of Ponivala Nadu are also suffering from uh, not having uh, pregnancies. So they go to her on her pilgrimage path and ask if she could please bring them the gift of a pregnancy as well. And she agrees that she will try to ask Shiva for that. But finally, one of the last animals to approach her is a pig. And uh, this is a female pig, a sow, that she had asked to have from the forest long back and had raised uh, on the farm, but uh, she didn't really remember it very well. And it is sleeping on her path and asks to have a child for her as well. And she, not thinking, kicks this sow and says, no, just get off the path. You're, you're in the way. You're being rude. Well, the sow was very angry. And so it says, well, if that's what you think. I'm going to go to the uh, goddess Durga, and I'm going to ask her to grant me a pregnancy. And she climbs up a small a rock here and asks for pregnancy and Durga grants her a pregnancy. So then later when the queen has three children, which the, uh, which Shiva has granted to her and they're walking through the forest, they see this same sow and that sow has a baby uh, who becomes very important in the story. And these are uh, antagonist they are the, the this baby <laughs> grows up to be an angry uh, wild boar who attacks the farmlands and the, there's a great 
contest between um, these children who are just growing here and the child of the boar. And there's, of course, no value all of that, but um, I guess these pictures are a little out of order. This is, this is the uh, Tamarai on her pilgrimage uh, going to heaven to ask for a pregnancy. She becomes a kind of a, an ascetic, a yogini, and uh, meditates for a long time. And this is just, uh, I use this in my teaching, the symbol of a lotus as representing her. She climbs a pillar and sits on a pillar, which is of course like the flower of the lotus sitting on a stem. And finally, when she gets to Kailasa uh, and kneels in front of Shiva, he grants her the three children that she's requesting. The lovely thing about this story that I really like is that in addition to Shiva granting her pregnancy, Shiva gives her this sort of magical pot of pregnancy water. And Shiva says, take this pot back to you, to your kingdom in Ponivala, and give every woman who wants to be pregnant a few drops of the water so that your pregnancy can be shared. And you can essentially share the, the, the goodness of this with your entire kingdom. And she does that. And it's a, a very nice idea. And similarly, her husband, who has now become a, a ruler of Ponivella, he's a very good man. He's very kind. He's gentle, he's helpful. He does a lot of uh, you know, helpful things, trying to lead and advise his people. And it's interesting in, in, this, in the story, one of the things that suggests that he's so kind and helpful is that rain follows him. And rain, of course, is a blessing and a very good thing for farmers. And so everywhere he goes, it rains. And that's an indication that the gods have, have blessed him. And then finally, this is the Chola king, uh, and uh, he recognizes uh, Kanudia and gives him a, a small crown to say, uh, yes, you are a colleague and a, an ally of mine. But then uh, later part of the story, the, this a small boar who's now grown into a great, huge, wild beast, whose name is Komban, a sort of uh, Raja Komban, uh, the, forest uh, king with the tusks, uh, tears up the garden, destroys the uh, sugarcane fields and makes a great mess of things. And uh, he also chases a number of the um, loyal workers and, and uh, farmers who have come along to, to try to uh, hunt the boar. And there's a great uh, kind of confrontation. The boar threatens to kill the two brothers and uh, here is their sister. This was the two boys and a girl born to their mother, Tamarai. And uh, she is kind of a, a visionary. She's able to uh, give advice to her brothers. That's very good advice. And she warns them, don't go, don't go to fight. You're going to be in trouble, but they go anyway. And they're leaving there to fight the boar. And there's a family uh, pup a uh, female who's, and this is a nice story, she doesn't have any ears and she's also very small. And so she's kind of discriminated against. And uh, the brothers don't take her with them on their hunt. They say, oh, she's too small. She's too weak. She won't be any help. And she gets upset and uh, she finally does go. And she is actually the one to confront the boar and, and he's a great bully and she's just a tiny little dog. But she wins the day. And uh, she chases him and chases him under a huge cliff where the two brothers and their assistant uh, throw a great boar spear. And that's the end of the boar. And uh, it's quite significant. I don't have time to go into all the symbolism, but it's important that uh, Vishnu, called Mayavar in most of the story, uh, blesses the spear. Uh, so obviously approves of the um, spearing of the boar. And the boar dies and his uh, meat is laid out as an offering to uh, the gods in the forest, but the head is not part of, of that uh, scene because it's very hard to make uh, offering 
uh, of food from the head. So the head is set to one side. That's uh, not an accident. Um, and Vishnu then comes in disguise. Uh, in the, again, the interesting, no time to go into why the disguise and so on. He takes the head with him. And that is essentially the turning point. And the, the brothers realize after the head is taken that their, the end of their own lives is near. And it's interesting that Vishnu, uh, in his disguise, he says, I'm a washerman and my uh, wife is suffering pregnancy cravings. Well, who is Vishnu's wife that might be? It would be Bhudevi, who was Vishnu's kind of second wife. And Bhudevi, of course, is the one uh, responsible for rescuing the earth from the ocean and uh, starting things anew. And so at the end of the story, uh, we have the boar's head being used by Boo Davy uh, as a kind of a seed or a, a, a embryo, you might say, um, that births a whole new yuga. And so this is the, the villages of uh, Ponivala Nadu uh, reborn in the new yuga at, with the Mangalam at the very end of the story. It's a lovely ending and says the, the bamboo flourishes and, and, and grows across the land and the, the uh, roots of the grass grow deep in the land and, and the uh, wells never uh, you know, lose their water. And it's a, it's a lovely ending, the start of a new fresh yuga. And meanwhile, the, the two brothers and their sister do die and they are raised up into the sky, blessed by uh, Vishnu and Shiva and Parvati and they join them forever after in Kailasa. And this is the way they are honored in a, this was another photograph of mine taken from a folk shrine where we see the two brothers and their sister Tanga all worshiped uh, in a folk shrine. And of course there are many, many folk shrines to the Ananmar in Kongunadu today. And I'm sure most of you have seen them, may even have some in your own family. Well, I decided this story was so wonderful, I wanted to uh, share it and I wanted it to be something that could stand next to any of the great epics of the world. And I believe that's true. And I've just written a book, which is, uh, this is different from the book I showed you just now. This is a book being published by the University of Toronto, where I compare the Ananmar story to a number of great epics, including the Mahabharata and including the epic of Gilgamesh, which is the very earliest epic that the world has records of, and it comes from Mesopotamia. That's one reason I think there's strong links to Mesopotamia. And the Epic of Gilgamesh and the story of the Ananmar have a lot of similarity, which is quite interesting. Anyway, I wanted to animate it, to make it available. And so this is in my own home, and this is my team that worked uh, to animate the story. And this is Ravi Chandran who was my lead animator, who grew up in a village in Kongunadu, very near the village where I stayed. His own grandfather was a singer of the story. And the story is very deep in his heart. And he did a lovely, lovely job of animating it. This is he and I together. And if you can saw me in the beginning, this panel that's in back of us there is in back of me tonight. This is uh, just various fun things we did while we were doing the animation. This was a birthday party for one of our animators. And there's another time when we went out to have a dinner together. We were all with a friendly group uh, who worked very hard on this, animating the story. There's a picnic we had in our front yard and we used to play games together and uh, just generally, uh, there was a very nice spirit about the group. <laughs> we needed some horn music at one point and we found somebody uh, who had a horn, was not exactly like the uh, horns in Tamil Nadu, but the sound was close enough. And so we invited him out and here we are holding his magnificent horn. And this is Priya. Um, she was one of our animators, uh, a uh, Tamil, whose grandfather worked with Shiva Kumar in the film industry. So she had uh, quite a bit of knowledge of film and, and uh, she was one of our star animators. This is the team who did the uh, English narration for the 
uh, animation. I didn't uh, have the financing to go hire, you know, fancy professionals. So I found a group of friends who uh, did the narration of the story in English. But for the uh, the story also exists with a Tamil soundtrack. And the Tamil soundtrack was done in Chennai by professionals. And I think it's up even better in, if you listen to it in Tamil than it is in English because the narrators were very skilled. The story was it's uh, about uh, 13 hours, I believe, um, in animated form. And it was uh, uh, broadcast on Thandi TV in Tamil Nadu and on the Asian television network in Canada. Um, in just broadcast in Tamil in India, but broadcast in both English and Tamil in Canada. This is a pen drive, which has all the animated episodes on it. And this is a Parcheesi game, the Tayam, as you would call it in, in Tamil. The brothers play Parcheesi, which of course is also a game referenced in the Mahabharata. And uh, that's a, a fun game that I've developed. This is now a, a kind of more modern version of a pen drive. You can, I have some copy of <clears throat> the animation on these digital cards. Uh, where you just flip out this little tab and plug it in as if it was a pen drive. And all 26 episodes are there in Tamil and in English. After doing the animation, I decided that uh, we really needed some kind of visual book telling the story as well, because as a teacher, uh, the animation is uh, helpful, but it rushes past things very fast. And if you want to stop and focus on something and discuss it in any depth, you, you need to have a picture in front of you uh, and, a, and a book uh, as opposed to animation. So I grabbed the stills from the animation, which in the original animation were done in high definition. It was very fortunate that that came to be. And so with high definition stills, you can create um, a graphic novel fairly easily. So the graphic novel also exists in Tamil in two, uh, two volumes and in English in two volumes. And those are both available um, on Amazon uh, on, in either language. So that's one way to access them. And uh, they're really fun. I find um, students from ages oh, 12 to 17 or 18 really, really enjoy the graphic novels. Also because the graphic novels are thick and heavy and there's 26 episodes, I broke them down into 26 uh, individual call them comic books. Uh, and so you can buy the individual episodes on Amazon as well as comic books uh, in Tamil or in English. And uh, there's also, as I said, this uh, DVD, which has the Pony Bella Parcheesi game if you want to experiment with the story uh, in that form. Uh, there's also an iPad version of the story that I've done. And the kids here in the Tamil schools, and in actually not, in, I shouldn't say Tamil schools, in regular uh, public schools, and we have a lot of uh, Tamils here in Toronto, uh, they have enjoyed uh, reading the story on an iPad. And this is um, now moving away from the animation and the, the visual representations of the story. I also have a book uh, that I published in 1972, I think it was, uh, which is a, essentially a, a summary and a rewrite of my doctoral dissertation called Peasant Society in Congo. And that was picked up by uh, Adialam Press in uh, Trichy, and they have published it, translated it very generously and published it in Tamil. So it's available in English and in Tamil, whichever one you prefer to read. I also published a book a few years after that on the regional culture, um, essays about the Coimbatore area, which is basically the Congo area of Tamil Nadu. And that was uh, published uh, in India, in Delhi. And this is my new book, the one that's coming out shortly called Hidden Paradigms, in which I compare the Anandmar story with a number of famous epics, uh, including the ones I've already mentioned, but also I compare it with the Bible, uh, with Mahabharata, 
uh, and um, with a story from Iceland, which is one of considered one of the foundational epics for European literature, and so on, as well as I talk about a lot of the symbolism and some of the links to uh, ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, then, uh, how are we doing? Are you getting tired, or do you want to hear more? Hello, anybody there? Yes, we are there. Oh, okay, now uh, shall I continue? We are listening. Or? We are listening. Yeah. You're listening. You're not getting too, too bored. It's okay. No, no, oh. very interesting. Very interesting. I have more questions to ask. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I'll try to finish quickly. I'll just give you some examples here of the teaching. Um, I've been teaching the story in several schools, and this particular teacher is now on the school board of the University of the um, City of Toronto. So uh, we have some in here now into the school system more generally. Uh, and uh, there's been quite a bit of interest in teaching the story. We also have a big uh, street festival in um, the Scarborough area of Toronto every year. And one year recently, we performed uh, some episodes from the Anandmar story on a huge stage in the middle of the street in the middle of the summer. And this is the audience. We had a huge audience, of course, mainly Tamils. It was performed in a Tamil area. Uh, here's the advertisement for it. And there you see the size of the stage and the crowd. That was a really uh, fun event to, to do. I've also taken it to um, after school um, classes that uh, do uh, various kinds of exercises and gymnastics. And uh, here, this woman is portraying the boar, and this is uh, one of the Ananmar, uh, uh, you know, contesting with each other. Uh, so we've, we've found creative ways to uh, include it in movement and do lots of things uh, that have a performance aspect uh, in classes. Uh, this is a trip that I made to uh, Batakaloa in eastern Sri Lanka in 2017. I taught there for a couple of weeks at the university, and I was thrilled when the drama department said, we'll take up the story, we'll perform it. And so while I was there, they actually learned the story and did a brilliant job of performing it. And uh, they said, that, well, we think the story exists up high up in the tea estates. And I said, oh, for goodness sakes, let's go find out. So we made a trip to Hatton, which is one of the hill stations in Sri Lanka. And sure enough, we found an Ananmar singer there. And how did that happen? Well, it's because the owners of the tea estates recruited a number of workers from the uh, Coimbatore area of uh, Tamil Nadu. And so by accident, a couple of the people recruited to work on the tea estates were singers of the Ananmar story. So I'm very happy to say that it is now um, celebrated and sung, and there are actually some temples uh, high in the hills in Sri Lanka. And this is one of the temples, and that is uh, the Sri Lankan way of representing uh, one of the heroes. Uh, this is uh, just to show that I've been uh, trying to uh, work on teaching the story in, in Tamil Nadu, not just in Canada. This is at the uh, University of Madras, uh, a uh, class in which I was talking about the story. And these are teachers, elementary school teachers uh, in Chennai who took an interest in teaching some elements of some of the simpler elements appropriate for young children. Uh, and so I was working with them in Chennai in that. This is uh, another lecture and uh, professor at the University of Madras who's uh, very interested in the story, who I've talked with him. I've also lectured in Bangalore. I've lectured for several weeks in, in Delhi and, and many other places about the story. This is one time when I said, let me try to be a Komban, <laughs> Raja Komban, and tell the story from his point of view. And so that's a pair of his tusks. And I dressed like the dark night and the, and the bright moon, which is one of the things that Komban uh, symbolizes. Well, this was just on my latest trip. Uh, in 2020, we ended up in Bangalore and uh, the family, Gounder family that I stayed with had this lovely indoor swing. And so I'm enjoying myself on their swing. 
This is in Toronto, a spelling bee where uh, a Tamil girl won the spelling bee contest. And so we gave her a nice prize. This is uh, back in uh, Coimbatore. Um, I was lecturing at one of the uh, universities there and uh, the students after the lecture asking me questions. Uh, this was a group practicing the parai drum at the University of Madras. And again, uh, I'm there in the background watching and uh, relating the parai drum to the Ananmar story. Here, when I go to events, I often have a table where I lay out some of the educational materials. Uh, this is for teachers, various ways to teach the story and the, the graphic novels. Uh, this was one audience in one school where they were uh, giving out the prizes to the students. And so I gave out a couple of the comic books to uh, young children who had won prizes at that event. And this is me with the teacher at that event. Another picture of me with the teacher. Uh, whoops, uh, the audience, another prize. I've done quite a bit of prize giving. This was a lecture that I gave at the Chelva Kanakanayaka Memorial Tamil Literary Garden, which is our big Tamil association here for literary uh, scholarship. Uh, this was an award that I received for excellence in education and, and specifically in Tamil. Another uh, Tamil Mirror Award, says me in 2018. And here I'm actually uh, talking to this kind of a festival done at one of the local um, community centers, I guess I would call it. And I've uh, I've got a lot of panels uh, with displays showing aspects of the story. And I'm talking to a number of women who are interested in learning more about the story there. More of the educational materials. I have actually a volume for each of the key characters in the story, a volume on its own to tell the story from that character's point of view. Another picture of the table. And then uh, there have been several, well, a lot of schools actually in Toronto were interested in social justice. And so there's also a number of uh, significant ways to look at the Ananmar story as a story about issues concerning social justice. And this is what some of the kids did, uh, displays that they had with, uh, you know, colosums and coconuts. And there's a little baby born under the rock. Somebody made it out of clay. There have been a lot of creative things students have done. This is the parrot in the story that uh, some students uh, made images of. These are drawings that the kids have developed from the story. And this is a big set of panels that I often take with me to display to conferences and so on. And that's me and my husband uh, standing in front of it. This is the lobby of one of the big public schools here. Uh, this is the panel that I actually have in back of my head right at the moment. This is the kind of thing teachers have done with it that I think is very creative, you know, asking what do we learn from the legend of Pony Bella? And the kids have uh, added various thoughts of their own. And I think it's actually the teacher has done the composition, but it's a nice display of ideas and thoughts. Here's another similar one, ideas and thoughts about the story. Cartoons and uh, various drawings kids have done the meetings I've had with teachers talking about the story. Uh, this is the school superintendent here visiting one of the schools and seeing how the story is being used. Uh, this is the premier of Ontario, not the current one, but the previous premier was a woman, uh, very interested in promoting uh, ethnic uh, traditions. And uh, so we met with her and this is my favorite uh, Tamil folk performer, uh, Ramane who does a wonderful job of uh, portraying the story uh, in a dramatic form. Here's him uh, working on a dramatic performance. Another dis table display of uh, materials, educational materials related to the story. And this is, uh, we're right at the end now. This is a currently happening and, and very exciting. Uh, we have three storytelling fellows at the University of Toronto who were selected for their academic excellence and they didn't have to be from any particular discipline. I think one is a biochemist, 
Uh, one is a computer scientist, and the third one is, I think, in literature. And I've been working with them, uh, teaching them the story, and they are working on telling the story. And right now we are developing a drama, which is going to be performed in May. Uh, and they are going to be the performers. So I'm, I'm quite excited. And it's, it's being run by the library, so it's not um, affiliated with any particular uh, department. It's kind of university-wide, and these three girls are getting a lot of uh, publicity from it. It's really nice. This this woman here is a Tamil. Uh, this woman is from Indonesia, of all places, but she's, she's a star. She's really good. And uh, this is a woman from Mumbai. So you can see I'm trying to spread the story and get people interested in it, not just from Kongo Nadu, but from all over the world. And it's worth it. And finally, I want to end with some pictures in my own backyard. You can ask me the story about these horses later if you want. They are, in a sense, genuine, um, you know, pottery horses, and they are uh, huge. You can see us in the picture to show you how big they are, and they live in our backyard. So when you come to visit me here, you will enjoy these two horses, and we can do a puja or whatever in front of them to celebrate their importance. And I sometimes invite uh, groups of Tamil children out to see the horses and just have a fun day out here on this farm, which is very similar, I think, to the farm where you are sitting at the moment. These are the horses in winter, so they have adapted to their Canadian home and <laughs> they enjoy the snow as well as the summer warmth. And so I thank you for listening. And this is our own grandson, uh, actually our great grandson, uh, standing in front of the two horses in our backyard. So thank you very much. Okay, that's, that's the end. <laughs>